Good morning. Let's sing the Lord's praises today.
be seated. Just before the message this morning, Joy Williams is coming to minister to you in song. of the risen Lord to renew my heart and make me whole. Cause your word to come alive in me. Give me faith for what I cannot see. Give me passion for your purity. Holy Spirit
joy be seen in all I do Love enough to cover every sin In each thought and deed and attitude Kindness to the greatest and the least Gentleness that sows the path of peace Turn my strivings into works of grace, breath of God, show Christ in all I do. Holy Spirit from creation's birth, giving life to all that God has made. Show your power once again on earth. Cause your church to hunger for your ways. Let the fragrance of our prayers arise. Lead us on the road of sacrifice. That in unity the faith of Christ will be clear for all the world to see. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Joy. Um, before we look into uh, God's Word this morning together, and we will be talking again today about our heavenly citizenship has its hardships. We didn't uh, get very far last week, or not too far out of the uh, introduction, but uh, that doesn't surprise you, I'm sure. So anyway, uh, if you would continue to remember uh, Shirley Masters in your prayers, Sean Smith's mom. Uh, she has been on a um, slow journey home to meet the Lord, and um, that, that day is coming soon, uh, getting weaker by each day, but uh, rejoicing in her Savior. Pray for Bob and Shirley and also for Sean at this time as uh, she transitions home, and we uh, know that she greatly appreciates all of your prayers and all of your thoughts. And if any of you do have a prayer request or a prayer need, uh, there is a prayer mailbox out in the front foyer, and you can drop any communication there that you uh, would want prayed over. Also, if you want a, a prayer uh, to be announced on behalf of someone on a Sunday morning, hand that to, to one of our ushers, and we'll make sure that we, we uh, share that uh, with the congregation as well. We're truly needy people, are we not? And uh, God is a, a great God and a merciful God, uh, a healing God as well. And so um, we look to him, the author and finisher of our faith. So a heavenly citizenship has its hardships. And uh, the longer you've been in Christ, 
uh, here. If you know him this morning, I'm sure that you can say amen to that. Uh, sometimes the, the Christian life, the Christian road, um, is not always the easiest. It is the most blessed, but it is not the easiest. It's blessed because God walks with us. He never leaves us or forsakes us. But sometimes the journey is tough because it's in a world that is no friend of grace. Uh, by the way, you have brothers and sisters across the world that are suffering for his namesake and uh, under persecution, things that you don't see typically on the news channels. Uh, brothers and sisters worshiping underground, uh, their lives taken, martyred for the cause of Christ or the things of God. In, in America, we are truly blessed that we have religious freedoms, that we can speak freely. It doesn't mean that's a given. doesn't mean it's always going to be that way. Anyone who lives godly in Christ Jesus or seeks to carry out the will of the Father, you will, in some shape or form, find resistance sooner or later uh, to that proclamation. It might cost you a job. It might cost you a friendship. Uh, it might cost you in misun being misunderstood. Uh, but uh, mark it down, take it to the bank. We're living in a day where uh, the persecution will visit the church before long. To what degree, I don't know. I'm not standing up here prophetically telling you to what degree we'll experience it. But every generation um, since the church in the, in the uh, first century and down through the ages, it has come and it has, has visited his people. And so... We talked a little bit last week about functioning as citizens of heaven while we are residents here on earth, and there are earthly values, there are earthly views, there are earthly and secular ways to, to look at life, but when you have a heavenly citizenship, when you're a child of God, you have a heavenly viewpoint, you have a biblical perspective, you have a way of looking at things and behavior, behaving ourselves as that which becomes the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we concluded last week that uh, citizens of heaven are on a collision course, if you would, or a conflict, if you would, or a tension-filled uh, confrontation or situation, and it is inevitable. Uh, we looked at James chapter 4 and verse number 4, and it, and it says it's kind of a foregone conclusion, or the writer is, is presuming that uh, you already know this to be true. Do you not know that those who are in friendship with the world are at hostility with God. Do you not know that? And so James was talking to uh, believers who were converted out of Judaism, and he was talking to people who uh, knew firsthand what that persecution for standing for, for Christ is all about. And I, and I want to share with you this morning that we indeed are on a collision course. Your views as a believer, as a child of God, your viewpoints, your perspectives, your values do not mesh with that of the world. And so that collision course is inevitable and it brings tension and it brings a distinction about where we align. Last week we looked at the book of Colossians as well. Set your minds on things that are above and not things that are here on the earth. Set your affections on things that are um, in heaven and not on things that are of the earth. And you know the, the, the passage of Scripture, very familiar to all of us, if not most of us anyway, uh, 1 John chapter 2, begin, beginning with verse number 15, and do not love the world. And we're talking, when you talk about the world, you're talking about the world system. Okay, you're not just talking about the physical world, you're talking about its value system, its, uh, its viewpoints, its agendas, uh, things that are, are, are out there in the world that are different than those who align themselves with the name of Christ and stand for the things of God. Now, it doesn't mean that Christians are to go isolating themselves off into a cave somewhere and, and as I said last week, sing, sing kumbaya with each other and, and hug one another and have all the fuzzy feelings and wait till Jesus returns. No, we are in the world, but we are not of the world. Our citizenship of heaven is lived out as residents of the earth. And so we are to have a godly influence, intentionally living and serving and being the light of the world. Uh, and, and that is where the opposition, and this is where this collision course comes from. 
men who live in darkness or do things in secret do not want the light of God's illumination to expose their evil ways. And so, of course, they're going to be against those who are walking in the light as the children of God. And so that opposition has always been a part of humanity. It's always been a part uh, since, since the things of God were, were on the scene, and, and that has been forever. So do not love the world, nor the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not evident or is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away, and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. And so there's a distinction there, is there not? We're in the world, we're aliens in this world, this is not our home, we're just passing through we're on a temporary um, time duration, if you would, and it has come to pass, but it, is not ha- it, it has not come to stay. And so, um, by the way, you're going to die. You're leaving this place, one way or the other. I've, I've seen married couples, you know, they, they, they tell me all the time, you know, we have a pact kind of thing. Well, the pact is that uh, we're going to go out of here together. I said, well... I haven't seen that one work very well unless circumstances occur. One of you are going before the other. And uh, I'm not trying to be doom and gloom here this morning, but what what I'm saying is that uh, the older you get, the more your body talks back to you, the more experiences you have in this life, the Bible talks about the the body's groaning and longing. It's kind of like in that earthly tent, if you would. Tents wear out. You take a tent camping, they're fine until it rains, and then it's over with, you know? That's why older people don't tent camp too much. We, we get up on cots, or we go to the cabin, or we go to the Hilton, or we go to the, we go, you know, we, we call the camping. So all these kind of things. But you see, we're, we're not to resist, in other words, the process. The more you let go of the things of the world, the easier the transition becomes, I remember Ron Allen before he went home to, to be with the Lord. You know, he, his, his son in Pennsylvania, he, he was a, a, a coroner or an undertaker or whatever you want to call him, and uh, he had those different positions. And Ron told me at different times, he says, you know, I, I, worked with my, I worked with my son at different times, and he lived in PA for a while, he and, he and Lorna, and uh, he said, you know, I, had, I saw the science, and I don't know how much clout you put on this or whatever, but it made sense. He said, you know, in, in embalming, the embalming process, I mean, this wasn't even near my notes. So anyway, you know, kind of thing. Bonnie started it with the, with the cinnamon tabs over there. So anyway, but he said, you know, he said, I was able to witness the embalming process, the biology of it and the, the, the science of it. And he said, you know, I knew people who personally came in with, with, with their loved one who had passed, and I, I knew them to be the children of God. I knew them to be believers. And he said, he said, without exception, that whole process seemed to go a whole lot smoother with those who were of faith in, in, in comparison to those who were not. A little food for thought this morning. So anyway... And, 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 and you see it. You see it. You know, I've, been by the, I've been by the bedside of a lot of people who have been called home, you know. And that's part of the pastorate. That's part of shepherding. Uh, that's what takes a toll on a pastor. I do life with you, love you. And, and uh, you know, been through that over the last 33 years, saying goodbye to a lot of people that I've loved and have ministered with and have, have done life with. And, and you've called me to those bedsides, you know. And... Um, I can remember Mary Bertani telling me one time when she was passing, uh, she, had, she had liver cancer, and uh, she said, and, and she was a pretty straightforward lady, you know, she didn't mince words with you. She was the same one who called me out in church one time and said, Ron, quit praying for all the ones who are sick and start praying for the caregivers, would you? <laughs> you know? so, but but I, went to, I remember going to Mary's bedside when, uh, when she was passing away she said let's get one thing straight I had just walked through the archway of the door you know coming in she said let's get one thing straight you do not pray Ron for me to be healed or to stick around here 
you pray that God takes me and takes me soon. You see, she was ready. She was longing for heaven. We sing about it, we preach about it, we talk about it. And your longing for heaven is where, where you start seeing the separation from instead of all your effort and energy is going to fit in, into the world and its system, it's living for God and, and knowing that uh, it's temporary and it's transitional at best and uh, at the journey's end you're going to be home one day. And so Love not the world. Don't get so entrenched in the world, in the ways of the world, in the system of the world. And so our citizenship, it it does come with hardships, and it begins with this collision course. God's point of view is not the world's point of view. Just simplistically putting that, and you could get into that whole dialogue and that whole discussion. So last week, if you remember, if you recall, we were talking about how did the early church cope with persecution? Well, they cope with persecution um, with this mindset that we're talking about. That's how they dealt with it. You know, we can, get, we can really get sucked in, can't we, into the, the woe is me's of the day and, and, and the political scene and, and how things are just going. How can God possibly be in control when this world is in such a chaotic spin? How can God be in control with all of that? Let me share with you. He is, he is in more control today than we could ever imagine. He is in more control in his timetable and his, and his, his plan. They're right on track, and it's working out just perfectly. And so we just need to see it from a biblical point of view. Oh, did you know these persecutions that we're talking about? We're going to look at this in just a moment. We're not to be taken by surprise. As if some weird foreign thing was happening Christians have always been persecuted. It's kind of based on the measure of how much you enter into the sufferings of Christ with him. You take a stand for Christ and you, you, you do it ultimately with all your heart and soul and mind. You know, there, there's going to be pushback to that. You're different than the world. If people look at us and, and know that we're different by, by hopefully the lives that we live, it doesn't mean that, that we live on that mountaintop or that we live sometimes extremely uh, different with our noses in the air as if we're unapproachable, you know, kind of thing. No, we're, we get down and dirty with everybody else in the world. We do life just the same way. We work the same kind of jobs and we do the same thing. But there's hope and there's promise and, it, and, it, and it's fit in the whole purpose and plan of Almighty God. And so look again with me at the early church this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And it says, it says, but we have these treasures and earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not of ourselves. And here is how they handled persecution. We are afflicted in every way. It's an everyday thing in the early church. It was just a way of life. You know, who's going to throw a stone at us today? You know, who's going who's gonna to crack the whip against us today? Who's going to persecute us today? It wasn't out of the ordinary. It was very common. The American church has gone quite extremely away to forming a comfort zone for believers uh, where we have our little cocoon here and, you know, we, we do sing the kumbayas and we, we, we like to be sheltered, but we have been saved that we might serve him. We've been saved that we might go out into the world, having been equipped in the church to do the work of the ministry, and that is outside of the walls of the church, so that as we live in a lost world, that we might intentionally have an influence and, and, and be a countercultural to what is going on, and that uh, people would take notice of God's church and take us seriously once again. But the, the, the church, in the early church, they were very much noticeable. They were on the forefront. They, they were kind of on the cutting edge. They were, in, they were of the way. So we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, uh, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Christ's sake so that the life of Jesus may be made manifest in our mortal flesh. 
The whole thing when Jesus came was to expose the plan and the will of the Father, to illuminate people in regard to their need, to expose the plan of God, the heart of God, the move of God, the love of God, in, in all of these respects. And so the early church, there was a resiliency. The early church, there was courage. The early church... Uh, they were persecuted. They did not uh, sink, but they stood. Instead of acting like victims, they saw themselves as victors, more than conquerors. How was it they saw things completely opposite than what was literally and actually occurring to them? Self-preservation is a strong thing. And when you're attacked or where people come against you and you're, you feel like your mortality is, is threatened or on the line, how well does your faith Stand Well, say, I've never had that experience. Well, you just might. You just might. I don't know. I don't know if there's going to be a day in, in, in the years forward uh, that there's going to be, there's going to be people uh, protesting uh, in front of the churches and, and uh, calling upon you to denounce your faith if you enter into the, enter into the sanctuary. You know, how, how are you going to deal with that? How are you going to be, well, read, read the passage that we just read. And I'm not going to go over the, all the same passages that are in your notes this morning from what we looked at last week, but uh, the early church saw it as an honor and a privilege to suffer for his namesake. In the book of Acts, that uh, fifth chapter, we looked at also Hebrews uh, chapter 10. And so they saw themselves as citizens of heaven, possessing what, uh, what was waiting for them uh, in, in the life that would come. And the Bible is very clear. The sufferings of this life, and mind you, persecution is when you suffer for his namesake, not when you're inconvenienced. Americans get it all wrong, you know. We, we, uh, we, 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 we like things the way we like them. You know, don't tamper with that. You know, we're, 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 we're very spoiled, if you would, as Americans. The sound of suffering, the sound of persecution, it doesn't just rest very well with us. But you know, they counted it a privilege to suffer for his namesake. And uh, they were waiting for the life that came. They were looking to the better land. And, uh, and all of these kind of things were, were the, the, the mindset that is on a collision course with that of the world's values and the world's viewpoints. So the second thing here about our heavenly citizenship and having its hardships Number two, don't be surprised when hardships come. As I said, those who are truly followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, and name the name of Christ, you will face resistance or you will face rejection to some degree or another in this lifetime. It, it is just a given. It's just a way of life. It is, is what to be expected. So we talked about this a little bit last week. Much has changed over the years. We're kind of like seeing this collision course ramping up lately. We, we see this, this whole thing looking like it's coming to a, to a head in some respects. And a lot has changed, but one thing that hasn't changed, those who stand for the will of God in an evil world will be persecuted. Second Timothy, in that passage of Scripture, and by the way, Second Timothy or Timothy himself was under the toolage of the Apostle Paul. He was getting ready to pass the mantle to him. And he was saying, as a good soldier in Christ, you need to take a stand. And when you think of the word soldier, you think of somebody who's getting ready for battle, getting ready for war. Why would these words be used in Scripture to paint a picture? Well, there is a warfare going on. It's a spiritual warfare. And uh, we need to be ready to fight it. And so 2 Timothy 3.12, it says... All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will face persecution. To what degree, to what level, uh, that, is, that is up for debate. And you might be here this morning and say, well, I hope it's kind of on the light side. But, uh, you know, I don't know. But I know it's to the measure and to the degree upon which you're willing to stand for, for Christ Jesus in Him crucified. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning with verse number 12. And it says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you. Don't be surprised 
when you see opposition to the message of the gospel. Don't be surprised when you see that environment going around those who name the name of Christ. They were very observant to the circumstances of their day, and this was going on. And so this was being addressed, this was being talked about. Do not be surprised with the ordeal that is going on among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. It wasn't a strange thing to them. It would be a strange thing to us in America. After all, we were founded, weren't we, as a Christian nation? After all, people left their homeland to find religious freedom so that they could proclaim the message of the gospel. After all, we're a Christian nation. After all, prayer is is a part of our fabric. After all, well, after all, Isn't America the place where missionaries were sent from? Now, after all, missionaries are being sent to America. The strangest things are going on these days. So, do not think that it is some strange thing that is happening to you. But, hear this, but to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ. So that is a self-evaluation. That is something you need to think about. To what degree am I engaged in carrying out what is supposed to be occurring after I have believed in faith on the salvation that is provided through the cross of Christ? Am I a secret agent, Christian? We talked about it last week a little bit. A neighbor finding out or a co-worker finding out after all these years. Hey, I'm a Christian. All these years I've known you, and I didn't know that you were a Christian too. Well, that ought not to perk up and say, well, praise God, there's another Christian here. No, that Christian just said he's been there, she's been there all this time. You just, both of you didn't know that about each other. That's an indictment. That's not something you should applaud. That's an indictment. And we need to own that as the children of God. So, again, it says, but to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ. That's kind of the level of which you live out, Jesus, that you're going to experience opposition. Now, it doesn't mean that you're going to get beat up every time you share the name of Jesus. We're still in America, and praise God, America is still the greatest land on on God's earth. There's a lot going wrong with, with, with things in America. And you know where we can place it? Right at the foot of his church. Because we need to be these people. We need to be people who cause others who make laws in this land or decision making to take seriously God's church. We're not, we're not being taken seriously because it's to the measure of how we live out our faith. And we need to live our faith and count it a privilege to suffer for his name's sake if it, if it comes to that or if it takes that. But to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ. And while you evaluate that and while you understand that and you do not see that it is a strange thing that is happening to you, what are you to do? Keep on rejoicing. Isn't that a weird thing? Keep on rejoicing. You ever been in a conversation with someone and they, you know, you're going through the same things that anybody else does, but they see hope, they see fulfillment, they see steadfastness, they see joy unspeakable and full of glory. Not something that you go around maybe even verbalizing at times, but there's just something about your countenance that you know that you know that you know that things are going to be okay. You don't know how God's going to do it, but he has it figured out because you've trusted him in the past, you believe him in the present, and going on into the future. You live the experience of your hope before a lost world. And you keep on rejoicing so that at the revelation of his glory that returning of Jesus Christ, you may rejoice with exaltation. And if you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of the glory of God rests on you. Make sure none of you suffers as a murderer or a thief or evildoer or a trouble meddler, but if anyone suffers as a Christian... He is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God 
in this name. So, we talk about suffering, we talk about persecution, we talk about all of these things, but it's about the degree of suffering you experience based upon how well you live out Jesus Christ. Now, you can even out live, live out the ways of God and you can gain respect. Not that we deserve respect, but... You know, I've had, I've had that happen to me too at different times, and you have as well. You can be in a situation and somebody you're in a conversation with is at polar opposites from you. And I'm not talking about how we get into political debates and discussions. That goes nowhere well fast at all. I'm talking about people will respect you when you live what you preach. When you live out what you say when you demonstrate Christianity, when it takes on definition and meaning, it is something that is applied to your life, and it's not just something that you say and you preach at people, but you live out the precepts of God and the Word of God, and they have been on the receiving end of that blessing. You might get ridiculed in the workplace for taking a stand for Christ, but it's you who they will come to when they experience a tragedy. That is the proof of your witness. That is the proof of it. And that is then what you were persecuted about, standing for that message or proclaiming that message. That's when it comes to their realization that there are handles there, that there's something real there, that it's significant and it, and, it, and it means something. For the sake of time this morning, Ephesians chapter 6, it talks about putting on the whole armor of God so that you might be able to stand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, the question before us this morning is, have you dressed yourself with the armor of God today? I knew other guys that I went to Bible college with. They would go through that routine symbolically every morning, putting on the armor of God piece by piece as it is described chronologically and as it unfolds in God's Word. They would do that literally in their dorm room every morning. They said, well, you guys are just a whole lot more spiritual than I am, you know, kind of thing. But, you know, it made sense. You learn it. It means, it means preparing yourself so that when the unexpected's come, you're not taken by surprise. God said they're coming. Why does he, he talk about an armor that is well fit for you and fashioned for you to wear if you didn't need it? Or the Word of God itself, the, the sword of the Spirit. And, and, and so we need to put on the armor of God so that we might be able to stand. And that question again is, have you done all to stand? And so, last, lastly this morning, why does persecution occur? Why does persecution occur? Well, when Jesus commissioned the twelve, he painted a very clear picture for them. He painted a very clear picture for them of what to expect, intentionally, not, not candy-coating it or sugar-coating it, about the dangers in a hostile world. And this is what he said in Matthew, in Matthew chapter 10 and verse number 16. You are being sent out as sheep in the midst of wolves. How clear could I be? And this is the point, folks. It doesn't mean that you go out in the world and, and people hate you but people hate the message that you bear. I remember, I remember as a, a young preacher boy, college student kind of thing. It was part of our, our training, you know, but I, I knew what was going on in Falwell's camp down there. We can, we can blitz the city here and we can make it a requirement from the students who are going into ministry to go knock on the doors, you know. It's kind of a, kind of a thing, you know. You're going to learn, but we're going to benefit kind of thing. And, uh, you know, we were told under the instruction of that, say, don't take it personal when somebody wants to throw you off their porch. Well, I might take it personal when my body is hitting the ground or something, you know, and, and feeling that pain kind of thing. Don't take it personal. It's the one you represent and it's the message that you share that is the convicting move of God's Spirit that brings resistance 
Before I came to, before I came to Forest Avenue, I had my initiation in, in ministry. I, I was an associate pastor in Tallahassee, Florida. That didn't last very long. People, when I came back here, he said, now let me get that right. You left Florida to come back to Niagara Falls. Yes, I did. That is a God thing. Let me just tell you, that is a God thing. And uh, I was hired at a little, little, little church, and I was to knock on 100 doors a day. That was my assignment. There was other things that were very revealing. I won't get into that, but, you know, it was 103 degrees. Here's this young guy dripping with sweat. I can sweat in a snowstorm, so just imagine. So I'm knocking at somebody's door, and you can look through the picture window back into the back of the house, and they're, they're sipping martinis by a pool, and there's a Mercedes in the driveway, and I'm telling them as a sweaty, messed-up-looking person that they need Christ. You know, well, yeah, that goes over real well, kind of thing. People need to know that they're lost before they know they need to get saved, you see. And so, in a day, I might have knocked on 20 doors, and when I found a nice air-conditioned home, we had a Bible study. You know, it just, just kind of happened that way. So, anyway, why does persecution happen? Why, does, why is that part of the scenario? Why does it come with a price tag? Well, as I said, Jesus painted this picture for them that they were sheep going out in the midst of, of wolves. It's a natural, worldly opposition to the things and the children of God because of this message and because of the one you represent. Let me just cite two of these um, situations and we'll close. First of all, because... Christians do not conform to the standards of the world. We don't, in other words, go along with the flow. We don't, in other words, go along with the crowd. Or do we? You ever notice about salmon when they're spawning? They, they go upstream. Everything else is going this way, but they're going upstream. That's kind of a picture of, of Christians. The world is going this way, going to hell in a handbasket. And here we're going against the stream. It's called being countercultural. You see, you're from another culture. You're from another place. And I'll throw that question to you again that we've been talking about many times. How long does it take for someone to recognize that you are from another culture? How long does it take? Well, if you're standing for Jesus, that might give it away. If you're speaking about the gospel of Jesus Christ, and more importantly, living it out and loving on people who are enemies of the cross, and you're showing uh, the love of Christ, as the Bible says, heaping coals of fire upon their heads, not literal coals of fire to burn up the enemy, but to, to love them irresistibly, taking away the weaponry of the spiritual war, that they can see the love of Christ unconditionally. We're loving at people who, who would return hate to us. Oh, doesn't that remind you of someone else who hung on the cross between the Testaments? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus demonstrated his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners doing our own thing, going our own way, not wanting anyone to, to damage our agenda or be, a, be a, a fly in the ointment, loving us anyway. Christians are to love people anyway. We devalue people, just like people of the world and the community and the culture. If they don't agree with us, then you're worthless to us. May that never be said of us. You see, we are measured with a different yardstick. To much is given, much shall be required. The, the illumination of his spirit, enlightenment to truth, we have, we have this now within our hearts that governs us, that guides us, that forms the values and the, and the system by which we live, and it's very different than the world. But don't hold the standard of Christianity over people who do not know Christ. Now, people can be moral, but they don't know Christ. There hasn't been a transformation. They do things out, from an outward standpoint of the flesh just, just to get along and be in agreement from time to time. But there has to be a life change. America is never changing because of who's in the White House or who's getting kicked out of the White House or who's governing the states. We get it all wrong, folks. Our citizenship is in heaven. That means our politics are in heaven. And King Jesus is on the throne, and he rules and reigns in the affairs of men. 
And that's where we have to live this life and live it out, or else we're going to be caught up in the whirlwind, which I confess, I get caught up in it all the time and, and think how incredibly crazy some people really are. Well, corruption and delusionment and all these different things come when there's darkness instead of seeing the light. And we cannot condemn people who have not come to Christ. It's not your job. We're to pray for them and to, and to, to love people unconditionally that we have been loved by God himself. But because Christians do not conform to this world, that is one of the reasons why uh, there, is, there is true opposition that, that is going on. And quickly here, looking at um, John, Gospel according to John, chapter 3, and verse number 19. This is the judgment, that the light has come to the world, and men love darkness rather than light, for their deeds are evil. For everyone who does evil hates light. If they hated Jesus, they're going to hate you if you stand for truth, if you stand for Christ, if you stand for the things of God. For everyone who does evil hates light and does not come to the light for the fear that their deeds or his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth, that's a key important word to get a hold of. Those who do not testify to the truth, it didn't say that. Or those who embrace the truth or use Christianity as a light switch when it's convenient, when I, when I, when I need it, or, or, or a religion of convenience. Those who practice it. Very important word. That is, in other words, a way of life. That's how you go about things. That's how you think on things. It's your value system. It's, it's the way you view things. It's just in your DNA. You've been created new in Christ. Behold, old things have passed away and all things have become new. It's just a new way of living, a new way of thinking, a new way of doing things. He who practices, and by the way, Christians need to practice the presence of God to be able to practice the truth. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Do your deeds bring glory to the Father to show that he is the light and the hope of the world. You see, I think we, can, we, we, we blame the world for confusing people. The church sometimes is the most confusing thing because we don't live out what we believe. We don't practice what we preach. We send a, we send a very mixed message. And that's why the church of the living God often is not taken seriously enough because we're called hypocrites. Well, this is not about a performance orientation where you get this right and you've perfected it. Sanctification is a process. Sanctification is our standing with God. Yes, they're both true. But because you've been sanctified wholly in Christ before God, he doesn't see you in your sin. But Paul said, the things that I do I shouldn't be doing, the things I should be doing I'm not. So I'm wholly sanctified, but at the same time I'm growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, and I need to be practicing it. I need to be living it out so that the world sees Christ in me, the light of the world. No man lights a lamp and puts it under a bushel. That's not the purpose of lighting the lamp. That's not why God turned on the switch for us and illuminated us so that we could hide it and be ashamed of it and shelter it and have it just for our little own blessing in our own little Christian community. No, we put it on a lampstand so that all those that are in the house, all those that are in the room, all those that are in the community will see that glorious light and it will make manifest that God's word is truth. And that is how we need to live God. That's how we need to practice it. That's how we need to carry it out. Do we get it right all the time? No, we do not. But thank God your salvation is not dependent upon that. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in 
God. A second reason, real quickly, that uh, persecution is a part of what we experience, what we go through, what we face, what is common, what we shouldn't be taking surprise over or about, is because Christians claim an exclusive message. There is only one way to God, and that's through His Son, the Lord Jesus, for there is no other name under heaven whereby you must be saved. We're living in a day where people want to expand expand the, the walls a little bit to be more religiously accepting to many ways to come to God. No, don't ever apologize for the gospel, but don't be arrogant about it either. Be humble in sharing it. Don't get over the fact that God redeemed you by that message being shared with you. It should be so overwhelming that it flows with us. It's making manifest the truth of God in, in, the, in the life that we're living. In the last passage of Scripture, in 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, and the testimony is this. That means the Word of God is this. It is written. It is settled. It is truth. It is the testimony of God. And I'll just back up to verse number 10. And, and, and if you want to do a study, too, about overcoming the world, read, read this fifth chapter of first first john and that word testimony the record it's repeated over and over and over again the one who believes in the son of god has the testimony where in himself and the one who does not believe god has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning his son and this is the testimony that god has given us eternal life and this life is in his son it doesn't say that his life is in the church it doesn't say that his life is in performance it doesn't say that this life is in being a good deed doer it doesn't mean that you're saved by works it doesn't mean that you gain god's favor by doing all of these sacrificial things this is the record this is the testimony that god has given us eternal life and this life is in his son period and he who has the Son has life, and he who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. It cannot be any simpler than that. And folks, that is why the church since the first century has been a persecuted people. Because it's an exclusive message. But let me share with you just another experience in my initiation when I was in Tallahassee, Florida. Oh, I can write a book about that. I'm going to write a book someday, I think. I can remember going to this one guy's house, and I don't know what he was growing in his backyard, but I kind of had a suspicion. But uh, I got into a discussion with this guy, and he said, I've had preachers come over here before. And I really don't appreciate that message that you guys share. I said, what's that? That Jesus is the only way. And you say that he's the truth and the life. And I said, oh, you must have listened. You know that message, don't you? And you know, he was the more he talked, the angrier he got. And I was waiting for the pistol, you know. But he says, you know, how unfair if God is true and if God is love and he is saying that his son is, is the only way, he said, that is just wrong and that is not loving. There's religious people out here that sincerely embrace their faith. And, and you know, it, he was very convicted by the message over, I don't know how long a period of time, he had heard it before. Maybe he was raised in it and rejected what grandma and them had lived out. And I told him, I looked him square in the eye, and I, and I, and I told this guy, and it, and it must have been God who gave me the response. I said, you know, you might look at it as being unfair and unloving and unreasonable and narrow. That word's in Scripture, too. And I said, all of that is true. But you know what? My friend, you and me, we don't even deserve one way. We don't deserve that God sent his son. 
that God made a way. I said, what you deserve, what I deserve, is separation from God for eternity and to be cast into hell and pay for our own sin. I said, how about that? Or how large does it look now that he made a way possible where there wasn't a way? And we didn't deserve it. And he was silent. And he said, you have a good day. (laughs) And so I did. I had a real good day that day. But anyway, we need to think on these things. The level or the measure of your suffering, according to those passages that we read, are in direct correlation to how you practice your faith and how much you're willing to live it out. To come under the possibility that you might suffer for the name of Christ. But when you suffer for the name of Christ, count it a privilege. Because that means you're being used as an instrument of grace. You're making a difference. And don't take it personal. It's the message you bear that convicts the heart. It's the one whom you represent that brings light into the dark place. So don't take it personal. But embrace it as a responsibility and a privilege to share and make a difference. Oh, and by the way, that's why you're here that we might live for Christ and him crucified. Lord Jesus, we pray that you dismiss us today with your blessing until we're called together again. May we practice our faith, and that's living it out before a lost world that is no friend of grace that needs Christ Jesus. We thank you for the privilege. We thank you for the honor. We thank you, Lord, that uh, we're more than conquerors. We're not victims. We're victorious. And Father, Uh, We need to see things in a whole different light, in a whole different way from the very heart of God that one day eternity will reveal the impact of your church in this generation. And what a time for the church to stand. What a time for the church to live out Christ. What a time to be the hope of the world. What a time when there's confusion and chaos and corruption that we might not be those who bring condemnation, but we would be those who would bring the message that states there is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. It is a message of hope, and may people see it in us as we live it before a lost world. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray and ask. Amen. And may God bless you.